Good evening, buenas noches. Um, it's so nice to be here at Shivananda again this year. I'm so delighted to be here. So thank you for the staff and everyone for inviting me again. It's really, it's not just a beautiful place physically, but Shivananda to me is really a beautiful place spiritually where all dharmas are, are actually um, presented equally. And that's such an important, important aspect to everything. So my Microsoft account is, um, is messing up. <laughs> Cross your fingers, because everything is on this machine. It says, I need the internet for this. And I have internet here. Oh, it's here. It showed up. <gasps> Yes, the blessings, really. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with a short refuge in bodhicitta prayer. O Sanje Chitang Sochi Chugnam La Chang Chu Partu Dane Jab Suchi Daki jin so chi pe su nam chi Trola pen shir sang je dru parshok In Buddha dharma and the sangha I take refuge till awakened Through all perfection such as giving May I reach Buddhahood for all So, tonight we're going to start training the mind in compassion. And I hope that does not imply to you that you don't have any compassion to start with. Um, that isn't the meaning, because in fact, in our tradition, we say that all sentient beings have what is called Buddha nature. In other words, we all possess the potential for spiritual awakening. And within that lies the heart of compassion. So you could also say that spiritual awakening is compassion. But in either case, it's because we have this innate potential that we can, by practicing using different techniques, further awaken our compassion and bring it to full awareness. And that's really the most important part of my path. Um, so in the beginning, I'd like you to really actually drop the idea of finding compassion. Drop the idea of somehow producing compassion. I would rather like you to consider that compassion is a natural extension of the mind that you already have. And awakening or enlightenment is the opening of that mind to experience its own wisdom its own fearlessness, and it's the, and the compassion that already dwells within it. So that's what we're going to do the next couple of days. In, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition that I've trained in, there are two terms that we refer to it during this training in compassion. That's bodhicitta and bodhisattva. So these are both Sanskrit words. In Tibetan, it's jangchuk kisem and jangchuk sempa. Uh, but in English, bodhicitta translates as the mind of awakening. So bodhi, re as Buddha does, refers to awakening. And um, citta, mind. Uh, one text translates it as the spirit of awakening. But in the term bodhisattva, again, bodhi refers to awakening. But sattva is normally thought of as just being awakening being. But when the Tibetans translated it, they added a little bit into that, and they made it the hero or the warrior of awakening. So the spiritual warrior. So that's the bodhisattva. 
So when we speak about bodhicitta, we make a distinction between two aspects or two types of it. So there's relative bodhicitta, and then there's ultimate bodhicitta. So we'll begin where we're going to start our training, which is with the, with the relative. So I have an explanatory quote here from His Holiness the Dalai Lama about the relative and how it contains these two types. So there is an aspect that is, in a sense, impure or tainted. And then there is an aspect that is called genuine. So what His Holiness says is, on the one hand, is compassion or love which is based on attachment or which is tinged with attachment. That type of love or compassion and feeling of intimacy is quite partial and biased, and it is based very much on the consideration that the object of one's affection or attachment or compassion is someone who is dear and close to you. On the other hand, genuine compassion is free of such attachment, unless there are cats around. I have cats at home, so I just noticed this one. So um, there, in the genuine compassion, the motivation is not so much that this person is my friend or my relative or someone who's very dear to me. Rather, genuine compassion is based on the rationale this is the rationale. Just as I do, others also have this innate desire to be happy and to overcome suffering. Just as I do, they have the natural right to fulfill this aspiration. Based on that recognition of this fundamental equality and commonality, one develops a sense of affinity and closeness. And based on that, one will generate love and compassion. So that's, that is what he calls genuine compassion. Now still, that genuine compassion is on a relative level. And it's on the relative level in part because it relies on an object. Even if that object happens to be all sentient beings everywhere in every universe, it still relies on an object. So His Holiness isn't writing about a non-referential compassion, but one that arises subsequent to an object appearing either to your senses or to your mind. As he says in the quote, it is based on rationales, on contemplation. It's based on dualism, which is not the case with ultimate compassion. So we're going to see a big difference between those two. Ultimate compassion or ultimate bodhicitta is often likened to the sun which shines on all. The sun doesn't decide that it won't shine on one person because he or she hasn't been good, nor does it shine especially well on those who have been, for want of a better term, good that day. In other words, ultimate compassion is not like Santa Claus. Instead, it really is like the sun, because it simply emanates from the mind that has awakened to its full potential. And in, in a sense, it's, it's as if whoever gets in the way of that gets these rays. Um, and as wonderful as those compassionate rays are, We, as trainees, still have to start where we are, in a sense. We have to start with our rationales. We have to start with our mental consciousnesses. We have to start with our lovely dualistic minds, within which we can set out on the path to reach the ultimate. So the basic spiritual warrior path. So. Besides the Dalai Lama, I'd like to introduce you to others over the next couple of days who have given guidance and inspiration. Um, some of them for hundreds and hundreds of years, some of them for maybe a decade or two. Um, 
First comes a man whose name was Shantideva, an Indian Mahasiddha. He's the one who wrote the classic treatise, The Way of the Bodhisattva, which is a very, very important book in our tradition, in Mahayana Buddhism, which means the great path of Buddhism, which includes the path of the Bodhisattva. Then we use this book all the time. His first biography was written in the 12th century, so I don't even know, nor could I find out, exactly when we think he lived. But here's what we think we know about his life. Um, Shantideva was born a royal, and he was supposed to, at one point in his life, be, um, what do you say? He was supposed to go to a coronation and be set upon the throne. But just before that was supposed to happen, as everyone was gearing up for his coronation, he started having dreams. And in one dream, uh, the Bodhisattva Manjushri appeared to him. In another, and Manjushri is the Bodhisattva of wisdom. That's his sort of, um, his, his thing. And uh, the female Bodhisattva, Tara, also appeared to him. And they both told him, they said, no, you, you shouldn't do this. Don't, don't descend to the throne. It's not for you. So at that time, evidently, um, if, the, if the son who was about to inherit the throne did not want it, then he was exiled. So um, Shantideva went off into the wilderness to meditate. And he meditated for some time. At one point, we discover that he was actually the minister to a king. And then finally, he ended up in Nalanda University, the Buddhist college in India. And that was where he took his monk's vows and where he studied and, and wrote. Now, that was what Shantideva was doing. But what the monks were watching was a guy who took ordination and then did nothing, according to the book, but eat, sleep, and defecate. So they decided that they were going to challenge him. And they went to him and said, it's time for you to teach. It's time for you to recite. So for the whole university, every once in a while, every single one of them had to as I'm sitting here now in front of everybody, only there were hundreds and hundreds of people, um, had, to, had to sit up and do something. And so they came to him and asked him if he would do that. And he said, yes. And they said, well, would you like to recite an existing text or do you want to do something original? And he said, oh, I'll do something original. So he came out to the, this compound where there was, they, they set up not a stage like this, but a very small stage, just enough for one person to sit on, which is very high. But the monks set up the stage without any steps to get up to it. And thought this was going to be very funny until all of a sudden they noticed that Shantideva was already sitting on the throne and ready to teach. So they should have known then, you know. They, <laughs> they should have figured it out at that point. But um, what happened was he began to recite this entire book, which is now called The Way of the Bodhisattva. And he recited chapter after chapter after chapter. He went through the six paramitas of generosity and morality and patience and, and joyful effort and meditative absorption. And, and then he got to the ninth chapter on wisdom. And as he was re, you know, giving out this ninth chapter on wisdom, his body began to levitate and go up and up and up. And by the time he got to the dedication chapter, which is the end of the book, they couldn't even see him anymore, but they could still hear his voice. So this is the story of Shantideva. And that was when he actually gave us the book called, now called, either a, uh, it can be called a Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, or it can be called The Way of the Bodhisattva. So um, I, I love the story about him. And, and um, he starts off his book 
in chapter one, which is entitled The Excellence of Bodhicitta. And there we find these verses. For many eons deeply pondering, the mighty sages saw its benefits, whereby immeasurable multitudes are brought with ease to supreme joy. Those who wish to crush the many sorrows of existence, who wish to quell the pain of living beings, who wish to have experience of a myriad joys, should never turn away from bodhicitta. Should bodhicitta come to birth in those who suffer, chained in prisons of samsara, in an instant they are called the children of the blissful one, the Sugata or the Buddha, revered by all the world, by gods and humankind. For like the supreme substance of the alchemists, it takes our impure flesh and makes of it the body of a Buddha, jewel beyond all price. Such is bodhicitta. Let us grasp it firmly. So that's how Shantideva began his treatise. Um, where the translators have used the word samsara, in case someone hasn't heard the term before, it refers to the cycle of existence of, uh, that is filled with, with sorrows, um, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. It's what we are, it's what enlightenment or awakening or the spiritual path relieves you of, as a matter of fact. So that's samsara. Um, but the question remains. What do we do now? How do we grasp it firmly? How do we hang on to it for dear life? And possibly, more to the point, what has prevented us from doing this before, right up until now? Why aren't we already there? So in chapter 3, we find in verses 18 to 24, these verses are famous throughout Mahayana Buddhism. Um, they are an aspiration prayer, a fervent aspiration prayer um, that keeps us mindful that we want our lives to act ultimately and by the end of them or by the uh, ultimate goal being reached of Buddhahood. Um, through these, these aspirations, our lives become beneficial for all. So this is the actual prayer. These are just a few verses out of the chapter. May I be a guard for those without protectors, a guide for those who journey on the road. For those who wish to cross the water, may I be a boat, a raft, a bridge. May I be an isle for those who yearn for land, a lamp for those who long for light. For all who need a resting place, a bed. For those who need a servant, may I be their servant. May I be the wishing jewel, the vase of wealth, an efficacious mantra, a supreme healing. May I be the tree of miracles for every being, the abundant cow. Just like the earth and space itself and all the other mighty elements, for boundless multitudes of beings, may I always be the ground of life, the source of varied sustenance. Thus, for everything that lives as far as are the limits of the sky, may I be constantly their source of livelihood until they pass beyond all sorrow. Just as all the Buddhas of the past have brought forth the awakened mind and in the precepts of the bodhisattvas step by step abode and trained, likewise for the benefit of beings, I will bring to birth the awakened mind and in those precepts, step by step, I will abide and train myself. So this is our aspiration prayer taken from chapter 3. So um, this keeps us mindful of our goal. And it keeps us mindful of, again, sort of what we're up against, I guess you could say. Um, but now, having gone through the aspiration prayer, we are inspired, and still questions remain, such as what has prevented us from adopting this attitude or taking up this training before? 
So in chapter 4, chapter 4 is called carefulness in one translation and in another, attending to the spirit of awakening. And here Shantideva points out some of the obstacles that hamper our progress on the path. So from verse 27 on, he says things like, I am as if benumbed by sorcery. I do not know what dulls my wits. What, of, what is it that has me in its grip? Anger, lust, these enemies of mine are limbless and devoid of faculties. They have no bravery, no cleverness. How have they reduced me to such slavery? So here he's talking about what we often refer to as mental afflictions. Sometimes um, it's translated as disturbing emotions. But I don't like that term as much as mental afflictions because the, one of them is actually not an emotion at all. It may be a foundation for the emotions to arise, but it's not one of them. But he goes on to say about these mental afflictions, they dwell within my mind. So he's talking about not, not the enemies that we might perceive someone outside of us to be. He's talking about that the real enemy of our spiritual path is within our own minds. He says, they dwell within my mind, and at their pleasure, they injure me. And all this I suffer meekly with no resentment, Thus, my abject patience is all displaced. So what he's saying here is that most of the time we're very patient with our emotions. We might not always like the way they feel, but we're patient with having them um, instead of being patient with others. So we have this wonderful patience that's sort of misplaced by being patient with the very enemies that prevent us from spiritual awakening, which are in our own minds, not outside of us. And he says, if all the gods and demigods together came against me as my foes, they would be powerless to throw me down. And yet the mighty fiend of my afflictions flings me in an instant headlong down. O oh, my enemy, afflictive passion, endless and beginningless companion, no en other enemy indeed is able to endure so long. We would rather say so long to all of these <laughs> mental afflictions, but they're the ones that we keep holding on to. And, you know, one of them is attachment, yes. And attachment might be one of the one of the ones that causes the most trouble, in a sense, because we actually get attached to the other mental afflictions. We get attached to our anger. We get attached to our jealousy. We get attached to all of these things. We're so used to, to experiencing them that it's almost as if, who could I possibly be without them? And it's a good question to ask yourself. I used to have my, my go-to um, emotion was anger, resentment, you know. And, and one day I just thought to myself, what if I didn't have that anymore? Who would I be without it? And that became my question for a long time. Until one day something happened that would normally bring up a tremendous amount of anger in me, and there was nothing there. And I was okay. I was totally, absolutely okay without that emotion. And so instead of having our go-to be one of our destructive emotions or one of our internal enemies, our go-to can be compassion. And that's what we're going to try to learn to do this week. So he says, all other foes that I appease and wait upon will show me favors, give me every aid. But should I serve my dark, defiled emotions, they will only harm me and draw me down to grief. 
So then he makes this, this very fierce statement. He says, no need to say that I will not lose heart, regardless of the hardships of the fray. From this day forth, I'll strive to crush these foes whose nature is to bring me pain. And this is a whole different take, a whole different perspective on emotions. And it's one that may sound to some a little harsh, or it may sound as if we're kind of bypassing um, the feelings. That's not the case. That's really not the case at all. Um, what we're trying to do is recognize them and see them for what they actually are. If we are experiencing an emotion and instead of engaging in it in the usual way, we took a moment and asked ourselves a question like, where is this? I'm experiencing it. I'm feeling this. But where? Now you could say, oh, my anger is right up in here. And believe me, it's not. Yet that's the physical representation or the physical um, result of the emotion. And it, they do, these emotions really do affect us physically. We're not just up in our heads. You, you are all yogis. I don't have to tell you this. Um, but if you can't find a place for something, what does that say about it? If we consider that question, if we can't find a place, huh? So we're going to meditate on this a bit tonight at some point and consider what it would be like to experience the emotion, feel it, and instead of falling for it or letting us, it injure us, if we could simply look at it and ask some questions and do some analysis. Now, you can't do this analysis of anything if you don't see it first, if you don't recognize it. So that is a first step. So it's never the case that one should try to shut down the emotion or not relate to it. It can be one of the tools that allows you spiritual awakening. So it's never about shutting them down or turning them off but it is about looking at them with a new perspective. So um, we will do some of this tonight. Um, in these verses that I've read, Shantideva only mentions anger and desire. And in our tradition, we do you explain that there are five basic mental afflictions. Now, out of these, it's said that there are, can be 84,000 different permutations from just five basic emotions. And so that's why it's said that um, the Buddha gave 84,000 teachings. And the reason that it's said, or it's called the uh, something of the 84,000, that's slipping my mind right now. But... The reason that we say that is because within the teachings of the Buddha, you can find a remedy for every single one of the 84,000. We're just going to talk about five tonight. So the first one is not exactly an emotion. It is a state of unawareness. It's a dullness of mind. Sometimes they use the Tibetan word timuk, which actually means ignorance. But I hate to use that phrase because it makes it sound as though it has something to do with your intellect. It does not. You can be Einstein, and you would still have this level of unawareness because you're not enlightened. 
So it's this level of unawareness that um, sometimes they say it, it takes to be true that which is false. It takes appearances to actually be ultimately what they appear to be, rather than examining them and seeing what their essential nature is. So it's that kind of uh, unawareness or dullness of mind. And that unaware state can be said to be the foundation for the other four main ones. Those four are anger and aggression, desire, attachment, jealousy or envy, and pride or arrogance. So in our tradition, uh, in the Kaju lineage of Tibetan Buddhism, the head of our lineage is called Karmapa. And um, he is now, Arjun Trinli uh, Dorje is now in his 30s. He is the 17th Karmapa. But the ninth Karmapa wrote a wonderful commentary, and it's called The Ocean of Definitive Meaning. And this commentary begins the explanation of the very beginning practices of our lineage all the way through to Mahamudra meditation, which is uh, the Mahamudra is the uh, is when the mind reaches a state of the highest state of realization. So, in one of the chapters, there is on calm abiding meditation, and there he discusses these five main mental afflictions and how they relate to the physical posture. So he explains there that we do have this physical body which we can see and which sweats when it's too hot and cringes when it's too cold. Um, we also have a subtle body. And finally, we have mind, which has no form whatsoever. So while we may not see the subtle body, within it there are channels or nadis and through these channels, the winds or airs or prana moves. When the channels become constricted and the airs can't move freely, then the mental consciousness can become agitated and an agitated consciousness begins to fixate because it wants to anchor itself. And so the agitation in the consciousness causes it to fixate on different mental events like thoughts or feelings, usually thoughts. And it fixates on a thought in a negative manner. And it, what happens then is the fixation on that thought gives it a, a lot of energy. And sooner or later, that thought begins to bloom and you're watering it, you know, and it's blossoming up into, into one of these emotions. So um, I'm thinking it might be time for us to maybe sit through a little more meditation, and I'll talk you through the posture and the channels and the airs. So if you'd like to first just sit comfortably with your hands on your knees, palms down, and you can close your eyes. And just breathe a little bit, relax. Don't try to regulate your breathing, just relax into it. So first, the yogic posture. If you're sitting in a chair, your feet can either be planted flat on the floor or you can cross your legs at the ankles, whichever is most comfortable. If you're sitting on a cushion, you can cross your legs at the ankles again or you can have one leg from the knee to the toe lying on in front of the other one so that both legs from the knee to the toe 
are lying on the floor. This part of the posture opens the channels or the nadis for the downward moving air of the body. When this downward moving air cannot freely flow through the channels, the mental consciousness will begin to fixate on thoughts that blossom into the emotion of jealousy or envy. The second part of the posture is to straighten the spine. The straightened spine opens the channels for the earth air in the subtle body. And this earth air is associated with the dullness of mind, with the unawareness. So when this channel is opened and the air can move freely, the mind can begin to reach out to a state of clarity. Now to bring the hands in to the lap, both hands palm up, one hand on top of the other, usually the right on top of the left, but whichever is most comfortable for you. The middle knuckle of the middle finger should match from one hand to the other. They, one should be on top of the other, and the tips of the thumbs just touch. This is called the mudra of equanimity. And this works and opens up the channels for the water air of the body. The water air of the body, when it's constricted, will cause the mental consciousness to focus more on thoughts of anger and aggression. Now, gently pulling the chin in towards the neck. Don't bow your head, just pull the chin straight in. Make sure the upper and lower teeth are not touching so the jaw is fairly relaxed. And the tip of the tongue rests on the roof of the mouth behind the front teeth. This acts on the channels for the fire air of the body. And the fire air is associated with desire and attachment. Now as you've pulled your chin in, the forehead has just gently in a minuscule way come forward a bit. And now you're going to open your eyes enough to let some light in. And you're going to choose an, a point of focus where your gaze can rest. But it should be a very soft focus. You're not trying to really see what's there. You simply want to set your gaze And this is for the air air of the body, which is associated with pride and arrogance. And also, in the subtle body, from the eyes to the heart chakra, there are two very important channels. And it's said that if those channels open up, then slowly but surely all the other channels in the subtle body will relax open also. And all of the airs will move freely. Now what we do with our consciousness during this process of meditation 
is we let it come to rest and settle on one focal point. And tonight we'll just use our breath, not trying to regulate the breath, but just settling the mind or letting the mind come to rest on the experience of the air that moves in and out of your body. The reason that we have this focal point is so that we can recognize more quickly when our minds have been distracted. When you recognize the distraction, release it, let it go. After recognizing and releasing, then you return to your focal point of the breath. So we want this resting mind to gently ride the breath. And we'll just sit for a minute or two. Is a verse from the Karmapa's Ocean of Definitive Meaning to remind us how to rest. It says, rest within the unceasing like the sky. Rest with clarity like a crystal sphere. Rest without artifice, like a child. Remain relaxed. And this, these lines actually have a melody to them. Rest within the unceasing like the sky. Rest with clarity like a crystal sphere. Rest without artifice like a child. Remain
Thank you. Tomorrow's um, workshop, we'll learn more techniques of meditation and engendering compassion. So I hope to see some of you then. And tomorrow evening, we'll continue on with Shantideva. So thank you very much. <laughs>